Well, now we've come down to around the year 1900 or so. What's going on and what's the situation in the United States? Well, the classical influence is enormous. We've got a tremendous amount of classical influence. We've also got um, a time period now when uh, we're starting to get in collision between the traditional and the modern. M machinery is becoming quite sophisticated. Mass production is starting to happen. The industrial revolution is upon us. We're talking about factories, oppressive working conditions, uh, people gathering in cities, working in these massive factories, population increases, people coming in from foreign countries in large numbers, the Statue of Liberty welcoming them as they come in. America becomes a melting pot of African Americans who were slaves brought to the country, Irish people coming in after famines, lots and lots of Germans coming in and settling all throughout the country and especially in the Midwest, Jewish people fleeing um, from a pogroms or attacks in their own country, coming to the United States and facing discrimination there, but being allowed to work in the incipient movie business and becoming pioneers of making movies. In clothing, in dress, um, if we go to the beach around 1884 or just before 1900, what we find are um, people aren't really wearing bathing suits. You kept covered. You tried to keep out of the sun because the sun was thought to be rather destructive. Um, and men might go to the beach uh, to catch a glimpse of pretty girls, but the glimpse that they would catch would not be very thrilling to us today. And people of the time actually talked about seeing young ladies at the beach like this, um, who would hike their skirts up and give them a glimpse of ankle, which would turn these guys on no end. A well-shaped calf. Really something. Back in 1884, I don't know why I did that, because probably not anything you want to see. Yeah. It's a little like a political map of Switzerland down there, but never mind. All right. So this is what things were like. Um, people promenading and, and very heavily dressed. And the canon of beauty for women was rather hefty. Women who had a, a, some weight uh, on them uh, were considered uh, to be uh, the canon of beauty, the, the paradigm of what was uh, quite lovely. But all of that was eventually um, and fairly soon going to change. Next one. If we look around 1900, Lillian Russell was the, the epitome of the beautiful woman. Uh, she had a lovely voice that was semi-operatic, but wasn't really good enough for opera. So she sang in the incipient um, entertainment form of the day, which was vaudeville. Vaudeville was simply a group of um, acts strung together, about 12 of them, over an evening. And there might be two or three of these shows in a day all kinds of different acts, uh, ranging from people playing musical saws to people doing drama, um, to singers and dancers and chorus girls even. Uh, and Lillian Russell was at the top of this profession. Lillian was extremely fair of face and hefty of form and fit exactly the perfect canon of beauty of that time. Next one. But then things changed. America, after trying to stay neutral and stay out of the problems in Europe, in 1917 found itself entering World War I. Europe was aflame. Uh, and there was this struggle going on between the Germans and between the, uh, and, 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 and the French. Uh, and America had to try to figure out what to do about this. Woodrow Wilson wanted us to stay out of it. A popular hit song at the time was, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. That was one of the biggest hits of 1916, and it was uh, proclaiming Woodrow Wilson's neutrality in the wars. 
And uh, meanwhile, the French and the British wanted us to come in and uh, try to help them out. And finally, uh, we decided to do this. Uh, in 1917, the mood changed. And the big hit song was, we're going calling on the Kaiser. We're going to go and defeat the Germans. And we all marched off to war, and we thought it was going to be a picnic. What we found over there um, was something that shook up America to its core. And young people like yourself, who were forced to face the realities of war, um, began to become more disrespectful of their elders, began not to be so reserved, so retiring, especially when they got over to France and saw the way that French people were behaving and the flirtatious quality, the qualities of French women made quite an impression um, on America. And the phrase, ooh la la, became very popular in America in 1917. Where have you been, young man? I've been fighting overseas. Where were you stationed? I was in Paris. Did you meet any French girls when you were there? The young man replies, ooh la la. And everybody knows what it means. Young boys who were raised on the farm, America was very agricultural. They come over to France and they take part in this horrible war. And they're transformed several ways. They begin to realize how short and precious life is. Why? Because they find these Gatling guns. They find these, these automatic weapons which are gunning down people. They find people wearing masks because of the threat of poison gas, which is not discussed in America particularly. People don't realize how much poison gas was unleashed in World War I and how many people suffered the effects of poison gas. It was quite a frightening thing. And people spent much of the war in foxholes behind barbed wire. Um, it was the first war where you could, uh, you could involve um, planes and, uh, and, and things from the air dropping stuff on you, which was another terror. Um, the fact that people would be pinned down for long stretches of time um, and could also be threatened with these giant mechanical devices produced by the Industrial Revolution. Airplanes, tanks, battleships were all coming in. And hand-to-hand -hand combat as people were ordered to try to storm and, and move these, these foxholes, these long trenches, um, which were placed in places given names like no man's land. Um, when they got away from this, when they would uh, get a leave or get some, some chance to be free, um, they would make the most of it. And if they could get to France and be with the French girls, well, that was something that transformed America. And when they came back um, and their elders were saying, well, go back to the farm and be obedient, uh, they would say, wait a minute, life is short. Um, we've discovered women. We want to have a different lifestyle. And wow, was there a generation gap between the older traditions. Um, mom and dad thinking they should dress their young lady up in Victorian garb, you know, um, and that she should have uh, whale bones uh, uh, placed around her so that when she was wearing her corset, um, it would not show anything. And then you have these guys facing this, getting a break, and going to Paris where the women aren't wearing much of anything at all. And you can imagine what this is like when the boys come home. And it was a hell of a thing. Next one. Um, Thorin? Excuse me. Melissa, I'm sorry, I'm just right in the middle of my talk here. I know, but I just had to say, I was taking a walk last night, and um, I was walking down your street, actually. My street? Really? Yeah, and I was taking a walk down your street, Yeah. and I saw that your light was on. Oh, that's nice. You should have come in. Well, um, I, I walked up to your house, and mm -hmm. I looked in the window, yeah. and I saw you kissing your wife, and... It was just, it was quite unusual, now, actually. Now, look, there's, there's no reason to 
bring that up in class, that's just terrible. I, I know, I just, it was so weird. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. it. It was just so weird. Well, I think that's really awful. You know, I mean, looking in my, that, you know, and as a matter of fact, just to show, you know, she thinks she's so smart coming up here and doing that. I wasn't even home last night. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have to think that one over a minute. Yeah, all right. <laughs> anyway, so World War I, terrible events going on, uh, and uh, what to happen? They, they, they eventually work their way back, um, and the, these are the, the, the soldiers. When they come back from World War I, by the way, they're supposed to get bonus pay for their services in World War I. These young boys, people your age, and the government doesn't give it to them. They don't get their military service promised bonuses. So they start demonstrating, and they go to Washington and demonstrate, and they eventually get attacked. They get attacked um, by a, a military force led by General Douglas MacArthur, and a number of them are killed. Um, and they are what we call the bonus marchers, and eventually, um, during the Great Depression, when they come back, they end up being uh, people who are out of work, forgotten about, and they get named, they get termed forgotten men. That's a term you hear all through the 1930s when the Depression finally hits in the 30s. It's forgotten men. Next one. Well, anyway, between in, in 1917, uh, when they're fighting, they go off. This is the song that uh, now becomes popular in the country. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? And the image on the popular sheet music is that you have the old farmer who's called a Reuben figure, the old farmer. And this is played in the shows and in the vaudeville. Um, I love this stuff. I collect this stuff. And I essentially live back in this period of time. So I really love this. This is a typical farmer with the beard and the corncob pipe and the Reuben, and he's got this primitive tractor, and his son has come back from the war, and he's got his primitive tractor, but he's also got a French honey that he's brought back with him, and is driving with him, and they're all raising hell in the tractor, and the problem is for the older generation to deal with these young people that have come back. Next one. Well, along the same time, oh, go back one, I forgot to mention. Along the same time, this wild living leads to protests in the Catholic Telegraph and newspapers, a big campaign of folks who are trying, religious leaders, to try and get people to behave themselves. And this leads to the 18th Amendment, which is prohibition. No drinking from 1919 to 1933. We'll get these young bastards in line. Um, no drinking. Well, that leads to the creation of gangsterism on a large scale, and people like Al Capone, um, young people are determined to drink uh, no matter what, and it leads to speakeasies um, and a lot of concern about towns, quote, going dry and people having to make um, their bathtub gin uh, and gangsters to promote it and uh, deliver it. Uh, and the 18th Amendment, um, by 1933, the Depression is so bad um, that people really need a drink, uh, and it is eventually done away with. Next one. There was also the problem of what to do with these women. The French women were quite emancipated. When the American women found out about it, um, there was a strong push to do something uh, about this. And Woodrow Wilson, who was quite a conservative fellow, um, gets equated by the suffragettes, the women who were campaigning for their rights, um, with the Kaiser in Germany that had been um, the enemy in World War I. Um, and they want to have American women being self-governed. They're, uh, com they're comparing themselves to the plight of the uh, poor Germans and the German people. And we have people like Susan B. Anthony struggling for women's rights and women's independence. Um, uh, and following on that, suffragettes, and during World War I and just after, trying to get freedom for women. And this leads to the 19th Amendment, which would extend suffrage to women proposed on 1919, right after World War I, right after 
Everyone sees what's going on in Europe, and it's ratified in 1920. Some states had uh, women voting long before this, even into the 19th century. But as a national proposal, women got the right um, to vote on uh, 1920, women's suffrage. And this triggered something else. Women now were not just staying at home wearing Victorian clothes, wearing bustles over their uh, rear ends um, and keeping themselves completely covered. Women were beginning to become more emancipated. Uh, they could do more jobs uh, than they were allowed to do before. Next one. So as this uh, trend continues, um, certain women emerge as the leaders of this generation in the 19-teens. Um, two of them were the most remarkable individuals, uh, incredible trendsetters who are forgotten today, like so many of my heroes. Um, these two young ladies uh, were actually from Czechoslovakia, um, but they were known as the Dolly sisters, uh, and they were Jenny and Rosie. Uh, and for a time in America, they were the canons of beauty, they performed in Broadway shows. They toured in vaudeville. Um, and one thing, uh, there were several things that were remarkable about them. Um, they were virtually talentless. Uh, they couldn't sing. Um, and they could only dance a little. Um, but one thing they could do was look good. Uh, and they were kind of famous for being famous. They got into all the newspapers because their great beauty um, there are all these kings and big officials, and they were huge in Paris as well. And every dance that they did, they danced together. They danced exactly the same way. They could dance perfectly in unison, the two of them, tandem dancing. And that's what they did. And they wore beautiful clothes, and you looked at them, and if you were a guy, you went to all your shows because you had to. Um, you were hopelessly in love with them. Uh, you didn't care if they had no talent. Um, they were extremely beautiful. Uh, and they were in the newspapers all the time. Uh, and uh, there was also something else about the Dolly sisters. The Dollies were not hefty. The Dollies were the first icons to be slim and stylish and do tandem dancing together so that when people viewed them, they formed slim curves um, and they could wear this beautiful um, clothing. They often wore short hair, so they even appeared mannish. Uh, so they, they helped to start this whole trend um, of the slim woman who um, had short hair and wore a kind of cloche, C-L-O-C-H-E, or bell-shaped hat. And this was a, a kind of, of, um, a, a, of way of dressing uh, that became known as flapper dressing. The flappers meaning that you were a young lady who was accompanying your male. You were slim. You had short hair bobbed hair. You wore lipstick now, and the cosmetics industries were going crazy, were booming. Richard Hudnut um, was talking about women fresh as posies now. And you were described as if you began to be described at the end of the Dolly's reign as a flapper, if you were a, a young female. And it meant you were like a little duck, just learning to make your way. So you fl flapped your wings and went along with the guys, you know. And you went along with the guys in automobiles, which were something else that were now becoming affordable and practical. And what could you do in an automobile? Where's my, my other mic? Can I have my other mic? OK. So up until now, you've had to stay at home. You've had to stay at home. And you, um, uh, and you, you, like to, you don't like to stay at home. You want to get out. And now you have an automobile. And what can you do with an automobile once you get in that with a young lady? Um, a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things. Name one. <laughs> They're a very innocent group, really. I was just <laughs> amazed to see this. The incredible innocence of the group. If I am forced to stay home and within a few blocks of my neighborhood and I want to go out and neck or go in, as they said in those days, as I used to do when I was young, go spooning. <laughs> if I were to go spooning a couple blocks from my home, I can't, I, can't, uh, I can't really do it because the neighbors are going to see me. But if I get an automobile, what can happen? I can 
go further out somewhere? Oh, thank God, yes. <laughs> I can go further, I thought I'd never hear that. I would go further away. I can go away. I can go, and there aren't that many people on the roads in these days. In fact, there aren't even that many roads. But you go, and uh, you can get away from your, your, your parents. And this horrified, the automobile scared parents more than anything because you got the keys to the car and they didn't know where you were, you know? And they knew one thing, they knew you weren't wearing Victorian hoop skirts if you were a female, which meant what? The guys could get at you. So they were very worried about this kind of a thing going on. And the Dolly sisters were the ones who pioneered this next one. And in case, here are the Dolly sisters, Rosika and Jansky. And they were born, oh, they were Hungarian. Some people think they were Czechoslovakian. They were from Hungary. I think I said Czechoslovakia, because there's one source that thinks they're from there. But they're Hung Hungarian. And they emigrate to the U.S. in 1905. They perfect the single-sex tandem dance act. They practiced it in front of mirrors. So um, everything they did, they were just terrible. Um, but they did it perfectly together. Uh, and that was just something that was just so attractive. Um, they, they started being underage uh, doing the performance, but they became very, very big as soon as they became of age, and they became stars in the Ziegfeld Follies, um, and also they traveled to France, and they were the toast of Paris. Next one. Here are the Dollies. I collect Dolly memorabilia. I love the Dolly sisters. Um, here they are dressed in a, a, a doing a, a, a Broadway show called His Bridal Night, and here we see uh, a popular song of the time that they did called Beware of Pink Pajamas. But they had to pretty much talk their songs because they couldn't sing very well at all. But here they are in quasi-matching pajamas. And this is the first time, this is very important. We're looking at slender women now. And this is not, uh, has not been the canon of beauty before. Next one. They also start the short hair style and make it popular in America. And if you think they weren't risque, they weren't a bit daring, um, the dollies could be. Um, and do images of dollies were sold sometimes under the counter. And, and they were also one of the pioneers in merchandising as there were dolly things uh, that were made and sold to the general public. So the Dollies in, the in 1912, in the 19 teens, shock and delight America and Europe and then in 1920, um, the 19th Amendment, women can vote. The Dollies do more than probably anybody else for breaking women out of the traditional mold and shocking people and becoming daring. And they're very important to remember, even though, of course, they're completely forgotten. Next one. Even more wild was Annette Kellerman, and I just want to mention her to you. Annette Kellerman is the most amazing, we'll have more to say about Annette a little bit later on in the course, I think. But um, Annette was the pioneer in women's swimming. She did marathon swimming. She tried to swim the Thames. Um, she was the first long distance woman swimmer. She also was the first woman high diver. Um, and she became a star on the stage uh, performing with almost nothing on and making movies. She became a big movie star again in the 1910s and she was known as the million, and even before in the 1900s, 1907, 1908, and she became known as the Million Dollar Mermaid. She was one of the most famous women in the entire world and her motto was, if you've got it, flaunt it. And she wasn't afraid to show herself um, with nothing on. Um, and she was known as the living Venus um, because her measurements were supposed to be exactly the same. And this was confirmed by a Harvard professor who measured her. Um, I don't know how he got that gig, but he was known for that. Um, and uh, she had the same dimensions as the Venus de Milo, a famous statue that had been found in the 19th century. So Annette Kellerman became one of the most famous women in the world. She was from Australia, and she became a power swimmer um, because she had rickets 
uh, which was a nutritional disease when she was young, and she used it to strengthen her legs, and she became the greatest female swimmer in the world. Next one. Of all of these individuals, um, we might mention uh, in the 1920s, the essential flapper, the most important of all the flappers, um, was a young lady uh, whose name was Clara Bow. Clara Bow had a rough life. Her mother was completely insane and actually tried to murder her while she was asleep with a knife several times. Her father um, was equally nuts um, and actually had sex with her when she was a child um, and was a notorious uh, womanizer. Clara grew up in Brooklyn with nothing, uh, trying to get away with home, from home, entered a beauty contest, won, got a screen test, and ended up becoming the greatest superstar of the 1920s. Clara Bow was described as the woman with it. And in the 1920s, if you were a flapper, you had it. What was it? Well, it was whatever Cosmopolitan magazine, which created the term, said it was. A woman named Eleanor Glynn, G-L-I-N, who was British, said that it um, was, the, was personified by Clara Bow. Um, Clara Bow had wild flaming red hair. She was thin, flat chested. This was the look of the 1920s. Um, she was vivacious. She smoked. She had repartee. Um, she made Freudian comments about not being able to get her eyes to behave and stop her from looking at something. Um, she generally behaved in a way that was a-traditional, a-traditional. Um, and I have a cassette of that. Um, can, we, can we have a brief look? This is from a movie uh, that Clara Bow made in the early 1930s, and it gives you an idea of the image that Clara Bow was able to project on screen. On screen, her wild behavior had to be explained. And so it was explained in this film as her being a Native American. And you know how wild they are. She was part Indian. Just about the finest girl in the whole of Texas. Yeah. Nothing but the best for Can me. we turn up a little? So she grows up a half-breed, and she turns into this. Isn't that your daughter? Yeah. Okay. Be up to now. That's a little bit of Clara Bow for you. Um, Clara was, was pretty wild stuff, pretty hot stuff. Um, let's go on to the next one. Yes, let's go on to the next. We'll skip Henry for the moment. Yeah. During this period of time, um, there was an awful lot of new things in the house, too. New things that um, people hadn't had before. 
Uh, and they were the product of what we call a, a, a new field at this time called industrial design, making life easier. We can go back now to a second. Um, one of the important industrial designers of this period of the 19, in the 20s and into the 30s was a man named Henry Dreyfus. Dreyfus was born in Brooklyn, um, and he was responsible for improving the look of things. If you had equipment, if you had things like an old, uh, I can remember as a boy <clears throat> having to wring out my clothes through it with a hand dryer. Uh, and um, uh, you would wash the clothes in a washing machine, and then you didn't have a dryer. So you take the, <clears throat> you take the clothes and run it through a, a, a wringer um, and hand crank it, and that was how you dried your clothes, and then you would hang the clothes up. And all of these things were time-consuming, but Dreyfus was one of these guys who improved the look of these things and made them look more streamlined and more modern and more functional. Next one. So there were lots of these kinds of things um, going on, in the, especially in the te teens and the 20s, changing American life. Um, for one thing, indoor plumbing didn't exist in an awful lot of areas in America and began to become more standardized. Washing machines, gas heaters, um, and as electricity gradually got more and more into homes, um, people delivering ice uh, on the street, the ice man, uh, was done away with. They bring cakes of ice uh, that uh, they deliver to your home. And there were lots of songs and jokes about housewives who were staying home and would have ice delivered and have affairs with their ice man. Uh, there was a very popular song of the 20s called Any Ice Today Lady. Um, and these kind of naughty songs, but with refrigerators, with electricity, all of these things started to, to change in the American home and people got more time. Automobiles took people away. Our lives were transformed in the 1920s. Next one. There was also this. With the 1920s with electricity and the beginning of coast-to-coast -coast radio, radio stations that could transmit and go across the country or good portions of it, led to special singers who had to be um, brought in to sing on the radio. Now at this time, up until this time, uh, what we used to call coon shouters were very popular in the entertainment business. That would be people like Al Jolson. And they would shout or scream. Uh, their, they had powerful voices that could fill an auditorium like this without a microphone. For the radio, that was fatal because the radio, after it was invented, had what we call vacuum tubes in it. And those vacuum tubes were very sensitive. And if you shouted like this, your vacuum tubes would rattle and frizz, and your S words would go <laughs> like that. I know this because I still have a vacuum tube giant radio in my living room, and it still works from 1934. Um, and if they play rock and roll on it, it makes too much noise. You know, you have some of the, the uh, heavy metal bands, it frizzes. It can only handle mellifluous soft sounds. So this created a whole new idea in music, which was the crooner. In the 1920s, it wasn't the singer like Jolson who got down on his knees and sang about his mammy and Dixie, even though he was a Jewish guy from New York. Um, instead, um, people like Bing Crosby came along, and he had a very mellifluous voice, a very gentle voice, and he would sing uh, calmly. And for women, there was a female crooner too, and nobody remembers her today. And you never saw her because they didn't have television, and she weighed 300 pounds, and she was homely homely looking, and her name was Vaughn. You feminists out there, you ought to remember this person. Um, she's very important. She was the first female star of radio, and her name was Vaughn DeLeaf, V-A-U-G-H-N, D-E-L-E-A-T-H. And Vaughn DeLeaf would croon. She would sing very beautifully and gently. And because there were not many shows on radio, whoops, 
Um, Vaughn would sing for four hours. She'd sing for four hours and um, have a talk show on the radio. And eventually it proved too much for her. She dropped dead of a heart attack at 42. But she was a pioneering first female, first queen of the radio in America. A shame that she died so young. Um, but she accomplished a great deal. Bing Crosby was the male version. And eventually, in the 1930s, as crooning on the radio continued, Frank Sinatra succeeded Bing Crosby. What was uh, this crooning all about? Well, you had to sing softly, and um, Sinatra became the real master of it, succeeding Crosby as the big idol, the big uh, heartthrob. Um, in the 1930s, when Sinatra became the, the crooner that everybody uh, admired so much, um, there were young ladies whose fashion it was to wear what was called bobby socks, which were these little socks that came up here, and they would show up at the Sinatra concert, and his fans were all said to be these bobby socksers. Now, Sinatra, when he started out, was extremely thin, and all the Sinatra jokes about him as a crooner um, in the 1930s, 1938 or so, they were, there were lots of them. The idea was that he was so thin, if he was standing on the stage um, and there was any kind of space between the floorboards, he would fall down and slip between them. Um, that he was so weak when he sang, so pale, because he could barely get his music out, um, that they had to give him, between songs, injections of plasma to get him through it. Um, he always looked like he was going to die, um, or that um, he might have a disease like polio, and he'd get it on the stage and have to finish up in what was called an iron lung, which provided breathing oxygen for the polio victims of that time. Anyway, um, I don't have a Sinatra clip from 1938 to show you, but I do have a cartoon parody of Sinatra, which we can put up. And um, this was a cartoon involving a, a character named Pepe Le Pew, who was an amorous skunk, male skunk. Um, and he's always trying to woo his sweetheart. So he decides to buy a Frank Sinatra kit and impersonate him with this result. <laughs>
That's a little bit of Frank Sinatra or Pepe Le Pew as Sinatra. Next one. I want to show you a few more things. Um, these crooners, uh, though they were big hits on the radio, they had to perform in public and they had no voices. They couldn't fill an auditorium like this and most places didn't have microphones. So singers like Rudy Valley, who were very, very big, along with Crosby, um, would sing through megaphones. Um, and instead of, of referring to them as singers, they actually were called megaphones. Is that megaphone going to perform tonight? And it meant that you'd have a singer like this with a dance band behind him, and you couldn't hear the, hear the guy unless he used a megaphone. So in the, late, in the middle and late 20s, um, megaphones became enormously uh, popular, and they're still used today for pep rallies and things. Next one, where you don't have those. Freud became incredibly important in the 20s as women became um, more emancipated. Uh, they were uh, part of having it, part of being a Clara Bow girl, would mean that you said shocking things. Uh, and these things could be quite Freudian. Uh, and th the, the inspiration for this, for this kind of shocking behavior, came from um, Europe. People like Irene Bordoni, who would sing songs um, like, uh, My will is strong, but my won't is weak. Wonderful song title. Um, Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers? A lot of things about people's eyes and, and looking into. And Freud was becoming a topic of conversation. You would get in your car and you would head on out into the night and you'd go to a what was called a petting party. And you might at that party start talking about Freud and his beliefs, his ideas. Um, the idea that each one of us had within us an id, ID, a kind of force that was deep inside of us um, that um, led us to desire for food and desire for sex um, and, and, and that this was such a, a big thing uh, within us. All these aspects of Freud, the Oedipus complex, this idea that um, we want to, to, to uh, have a relationship with, with the mother or to have a, an inferiority complex that we feel inferior for one reason or another or another. We shock people with our frank and open uh, dialogue. Um, and this led to movies that were very Freudian, that were re talking about releasing people's libidos, people staring lecherously. Um, there was a whole wave of these movies in Europe, in Germany in particular, and in the United States, and shows that were quite naughty, that were starring people like Irene Bordoni, who was an Italian sex pot from the time. So Freud was very big, Freudian ideas, and the notion of controlling your id, having an ego and a super ego, having the influence of your parents on you. How do you keep these things in control? And people were writing shows and movies um, about these particular wild themes. Next one, that were emerging in the 1920s. I want to mention just one other uh, aspect here. In the 1920s, along with all this influence from Europe and stars like Irene Bordoni coming to the United States um, and this notion of the new woman, came European art styles. And the great style of the 1920s um, was a style of elegance. Um, be European. Be cosmopolitan. Do the things they're doing in Paris. And from Paris came a fantastic style called Art Deco. And this is Art Deco that we're looking at, that we'll look at in a, in a moment. A lot of it was influenced by the discoveries going on in ancient Egypt of King Tutankhamun's tomb um, made in uh, 1922 by Howard Carter. And the wealth, the beauty of the King Tut discoveries um, and the curse of Tut, the idea that people connected with this were dying uh, mysteriously, was spread in the papers. So the Egyptian look became fused with this Art Deco idea. Next one. Um, here is Carter and, and the um, mummy of King Tut. Next one. Um, these, this romance of Egypt. Egypt became hot again 
um, stylish, trendy, vogue -y. Um, people talked about Egypt. Shows were made about Egypt. Next one. Um, and sheet music showing the pyramids, camels, the great sphinx, women making movies about Cleopatra. The movie that you saw, Cleopatra, was part of this whole Egyptomania uh, that kicked into America in the 1920s following Howard Carter's the British archaeologist's discovery. Next. So shows like this, um, images that were Egyptian, um, lots and lots of images all through the 1920s, even the Ziegfeld Follies after Carter's discovery. Next one. And this also became popular in the Art Deco movement. The Deco movement took beautiful glass and jewels, um, lovely architecture, chromium, modern materials, elegant traditional materials, and put it together in ornament that was non-historical um, and yet could be influenced by history. So you could get Carlton glassware like this that looks vaguely uh, like a papyrus form, like growing Egyptian papyrus, but in reality is a collection of beautiful strong colors and um, non-historical filler ornament inside of it that gives a bright and gay and elegant uh, look. And this was the essence of the deco style, started in France um, about 1925. Next one. Um, the Dolly sisters and their vaudeville performances became the models for the flappers. And in France, the dollies were enormously popular. And art deco designers like uh, Dimitri Chiparus um, did works like this, the exotic girl, which were typical. He was a Romanian art deco sculptor. The thin form, the exotic look, um, the stepped base, um, the uh, ankle bracelets, um, all of this and the non-historical ornament and the cloche hats all emerged to create the deco style and the deco woman that was very big all over Europe and also even into the United States. Next one. The sunburst look was big too. Up until now, we hadn't gone to the beach, but now we go and everything gets brilliant and lit with sun. The sun becomes important. A man named Auguste Rollier, R-O-L-L-I-E-R, -L -L -E opened up in Switzerland a clinic and he called it his clinic for heliotherapy. If you were dying of tuberculosis, which was a very common disease then, you, and you had the money, you went off to Rollier's clinic and he exposed you to ultraviolet light, to the sun. And he was able to document that people who were exposed to the sun were healed by the sun and were generally more healthy. He put you on a diet and exercise and sun. And the Rollier sun movement spread all across um, the Europe and all across America, and it created more than just a healing place for people to go to dying of tuberculosis. It created the whole sunburst effect, the whole solar imagery, which influenced Art Deco in the 1920s and became very, very important in American art and American movies, creating the yellow look, the blonde look, and ushering in the era of the American movie blonde, uh, Gene Harlow, Ginger Rogers, all these moon-faced, Shirley Temple, all these moon-faced American blondes of the 30s can trace their roots back to the heliotherapy clinic of Auguste Rollier. Well, I've probably said enough to you. We'll put our list of 50 up, and uh, I'll see you next time.